Muy buenos días. Good morning. This is the latest seminar of uh, our series of seminars of this term. And we are honored by the present with, with us of the Professor Matthew Kramer. Matthew is a professor of legal and political philosophy in the Cambridge University, uh, director also of Cambridge Forum for Legal and Politi Political Philosophy. He's uh, author of a great number of books. In, or in order to mention only the, the most uh, recent books, we can mention The Quality of Freedom, Where Law and Morality, morality Meet, Objectivity and the Rule of Law, and the latest one is this, Moral Realism as a Moral Doctrine, that I received yesterday. <laughs> and I, and I, I read completely <laughs> this night. <laughs> Yes, Jordi was able to tell me what the first word on page 248 was. <laughs> no, sorry. And he's also editor of a, a, a great number of, of, of books. Um, the legacy of uh, hard legal, political, and moral philosophy maybe is uh, one of is one of the most recent books yep. uh, ed ed edited by uh, Matthew and, and also is, is a book that is in, uh, we have, uh, uh, we, we, we are uh, impressed by, by this book also because uh, it is uh, in, in, in translation in, in, in this moment for our series in, in, in Marcel Pons, uh, uh, editor, publisher. Well, uh, today the, the argument of the seminar is uh, freedom and the rule of law. And I think the handout is uh, distributed by, by email and you, all of you have the, the handout. And then uh, the word is for Matthew. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jordi. Thank you very much for inviting me to this seminar and for your hospitality. M many of you were at dinner last night and I'm grateful to you for coming then and for attending now and also of course to the rest of you for attending the seminar. So I'm very pleased to be here and to uh, participate in this series. I was saying to Andrea at the outset that um, in the English speaking world uh, Girona now stands I would say as the most prominent place for the philosophy of law. If someone were to ask me uh, today in the English speaking world, we are to go in Spain for legal philosophy. The first place I would name is Girona, and that was certainly not the case ten years ago. I don't think I would have named Girona at all ten years ago, so um, it's a great tribute to those who are making efforts to um, create a vibrant jurisprudential culture here, that they have really succeeded. Um, I'm going to be talking about freedom and the rule of law today and I will r uh, talk through much of the paper, <clears throat> about 60% of the paper, and then read the rest. Um, I'm going to read the rest simply because it's easier for me to state my argument precisely if I'm reading it than if I try to talk it through. But the first half, or slightly over half of the talk, I will um, just present some remarks to you. So let me begin with two preliminary points that are on the board here. Um, these are just terminological points. Uh, the first is to note that I will use the terms freedom and liberty interchangeably. Um, some philosophers distinguish between those terms in discussions of freedom or liberty, um, but most philosophers do not, and I, I do not. I, I use those terms as synonyms. Um, the second thing is uh, the distinction between the rule of law with 
up lowercase letters, uh, uncapitalized letters, and the rule of law in uppercase letters. Um, in a book of mine published in 2007 called Objectivity and the Rule of Law, I distinguish between the rule of law and the rule of law. The, the rule of law in lowercase letters I take to be the, uh, to consist in the necessary and sufficient conditions for the existence of any legal system, whatever the political complexion of the system may be. And so what I would have in mind, for example, would be the eight principles of legality identified by Lon Fuller. That, that's what I would characterize as the rule of law in the first sense. In the second sense, the rule of law in uppercase letters, um, it would be consist in the existence of a legal system that is both promotive and expressive of liberal democratic values. So a liberal democratic legal system. Um, now, Fuller, of course, didn't really accept a distinction between these two things, or at least he thought the distinction was um, highly problematic. As a legal positivist, I insist on the distinction between these two. And the important point for present purposes is simply to note that when I talk about the rule of law in this paper, when the title of this paper is The Freedom and the Rule of Law, it's using the rule of law in the first sense rather than in the second sense. So I'm talking about the rule of law as it pertains to all legal systems, not just to liberal democratic legal systems. Okay, okay well, those are just terminological points. I now want to turn to the handout. And as I say, for the first half or so, I will simply be talking through what is here, and then I will go on to read the, the concluding portion of the paper. So, an exposition of negative liberty, because what I, under, in my book, The Quality of Freedom, which Jordi mentioned, um, I take freedom to be negative liberty, and I distinguish it from a number of other different types of freedom, some of which I will mention here a bit later. Um, <clears throat> but to start with an exposition of negative liberty, I offer two postulates. The first is the F postulate, the freedom postulate. A person is free to phi if and only if he is able to phi. Now, the Greek letter phi, as is standard in philosophical discourse, the Greek letter phi stands for a, a verb or a verb phrase. Um, and the verb or verb phrase can cover uh, the performance of an action, or it can cover the existence in some state, or it can, uh, <coughs> the existence in some state or condition, or it can cover the development, the change um, undergone by someone. So whatever a phi may stand for, it, it simply indicates, usually it will stand for the performance of an action, but it can also cover processes of change or existence. Um, and as I indicate in the footnote, there are alternative formulations of this F postulate. Uh, so that we might say instead a person is free to phi if and only if it is possible for him to phi. Or a person is free to phi if and only if he is unprevented from phying. Those alternative formulations are, are exactly the same logically and semantically. It's just that grammatically they may be more suitable in certain contexts. That, that is, they, make, they may make stylistically better uh, renderings of this postulate in certain contexts. But semantically and logically, they're exactly the same. Okay, so that's the first postulate. It's quite straightforward. I'll say a little bit more about it, but it's quite straightforward. The second postulate is much more complicated, and so I'll, I'll say more about it. The second postulate is the uh, U postulate, the unfreedom postulate. And this states, <coughs> A person is unfree to phi if and only if both of the following conditions obtain. First, he would be able to phi in the absence of the second of these conditions. And second, irrespective of whether he actually endeavors to phi, 
he is directly or indirectly prevented from flying by some action or some disposition to perform some action on the part of some other person. Okay, well, the U postulate, as I've indicated, is obviously more complicated than the F postulate. And so I'm going to clarify it a little bit. And so the first of these clarificatory remarks um, <coughs> concerns the reference to dispositions in the U postulate. It talks of dispositions. And I take behavioral dispositions to be, or indeed other types of dispositions, to be prevent preventative factors in many contexts. That is, factors that prevent people from doing certain things. Um, and it's essential, I think, for any proper account of freedom that dispositions be treated in this way. So let's take a simple example to make the point vividly. Suppose that um, outside this room there stand several people with machine guns who are ready to, to shoot instantly anyone who attempts to leave. So if you're bored by this seminar, you're in tough luck, I'm afraid, because you're, uh, if you step outside that door, you're dead. Um, and suppose that because you find the topic sufficiently interesting, or perhaps you fall asleep, or whatever the reason for your um, failure to try to leave the room may be, um, no one in fact does try to leave the room. And so there's no occasion for these people with machine guns outside the doors to fire their weapons. And <clears throat> therefore there's no actual shooting, there's no actual application of force. Nonetheless, it would be grossly distortive to say that their presence outside the door and their readiness to shoot in the event that anyone tries to leave has had no effect on your freedom. Clearly, given the understanding of freedom here, that is, as being able to do things, no one is able to leave this room. I should say this is purely hypothetical. You don't, if, if you do need to leave, you're not going to be shot. But, uh, <laughs> um, but, um, but in the circumstances depicted here, no one is able to leave because of the dispositions of the people outside the room, the fact that they're disposed to shoot anyone who attempts to leave. And so it's essential that we, for a proper account of freedom that we take into account behavioral dispositions. And although they're explicitly taken into account only in the U postulate, they're in fact of central importance also for the F postulate because behavioral dispositions also play a crucial role in cre uh, uh, creating and sustaining freedom, various freedoms for each individual. So for example, it's the fact that various people are disposed to act in certain ways that um, that each of us who will be flying back to the United Kingdom today is able to fly back to the United Kingdom and so forth. So behavioral dispositions are crucial both for the creation of unfreedoms but also for the creation of, um, of freedoms. So they're explicitly taken into account in the U postulate. A second point to note is that Given the content of the F postulate and the content of the U postulate, they are not jointly exhaustive in their coverage. That is, there are many situations, indeed countless situations, that lie outside the, the union of these two postulates. Um, and so the, the concept of freedom as I'm explicating it is trivalent rather than bivalent. That is, it's three-valued rather than two-valued. And so instead of separating people's abilities and inabilities into freedoms and unfreedoms dichotomously, the concept of freedom as I'm explicating it separates abilities and inabilities into freedoms, unfreedoms, and mere inabilities or natural inabilities. So let's take an example. Suppose you ask me, am I free or unfree to jump um, 50 meters off the ground when we're outside? Let's assume we're not in here. Let's assume we're outside. Um, and I 
I answer, well, I'm clearly not free to jump 50 meters off the ground because it's not the case that I'm able to do that. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but uh, I'm not able to do that. Um, but it's also not the case that I'm unfree to do that. And the reason I'm not unfree to do that, even if I am being prevented by somebody else, is that the first condition in the U postulate, the U postulate establishes two conditions for the existence of unfreedoms. The first of which is that I'm able to fly in the absence of the second of the conditions. Well, even if the second condition is satisfied, in fact, it probably won't be. Typically, I'm not prevented by anybody from jumping 50 feet off the ground when I'm outside. But even if I am, the first condition is not satisfied. So it's neither the case that I'm free to jump 50 meters off the ground, nor the case that I'm unfree to jump 50 meters off the ground. Instead, I'm merely unable. I'm naturally unable to do that. Now, a, a very small amount of reflection should make clear that our natural inabilities, our mere inabilities, are infinitely expansive in their scope. Because if it's not the case that I'm free or unfree to jump 50 meters off the ground, it's also the case that I'm neither free nor unfree to soar around the Milky Way galaxy, or to soar around the Milky Way galaxy twice or three times, and so forth. So mere inabilities, natural inabilities, are infinitely expansive in their scope. And it's precisely that fact about natural inabilities or mere inabilities that leads me to adopt a trivalent conception of freedom as opposed to a bivalent conception. In order to explain that point, in order to explain why I opt for this trivalent schema rather than a bivalent schema, I have to go on to the next clarificatory remark, which is that the two postulates, the U postulate and the F postulate, respe uh, the, uh, F postulate respectively, the F postulate deals with particular freedoms and the U postulate deals with particular unfreedoms. And I'm using the plural here, freedoms and unfreedoms. So these are particular freedoms, particular unfreedoms. That is, instances of freedom, instances of unfreedom. And these are um, instances with specifiable contents. So for example, if I were free to jump 50 meters off the ground, the content would be jumping 50 meters off the ground, the content of that freedom. In fact, I'm not free to do that, but if I were, that would be the content. And that's to be contrasted with what in my book, The Quality of Freedom, I call overall freedom. <clears throat> um, this is also a phrase used by Ian Carter, whose book, uh, whose 1999 book, A Measure of Freedom, is a superb book, I think. My own book is both a continuation of Carter's project and a critique of his project. Um, and uh, overall liberty is the property that we're seeking to measure when we're asking how free somebody is or how free people collectively are. Um, and so the answer to a question of how free someone is, or whether someone is more free than before, or more free than a person in another society, those are all questions about someone's overall liberty. And the overall liberty is, is a complicated aggregation over particular freedoms, particular liberties, and also over particular unfreedoms. I'm not going, in this <coughs> presentation, I can't possibly go into the complexities of this aggregation. In my book, I deal with it at great length, but in the book, The Quality of Freedom. But here, I, I'm simply mentioning it rather than expounding it for you because there's not time. But the reason I raise it here is to explain that in aggregating over particular freedoms and unfreedoms, we have to exclude mere inabilities, natural inabilities, precisely because they're infinitely expansive in their scope. Because if we were to include mere inab uh, inabilities, either as freedoms or as unfreedoms, we would end up 
undermining any aim of measuring people's overall liberty because either their overall freedom or their overall unfreedom would be infinitely expansive and therefore the uh, the project of measuring people's liberty would be doomed it would be doomed in principle as well as in practice and so although I can't go into the details, the complexities of measuring freedom here, that's a topic for another seminar, um, or maybe a few other seminars, um, I can simply say that in the, in the endeavor of aggregating over particular freedoms, we have to exclude mere inabilities because they're infinitely extensive and therefore taking them into account would doom the project of measuring liberty from the outset. Okay, sorry, sorry. Um, so I can't substantiate that point, I simply mention it here so that you'll understand why I adopt a trivalent conception of freedom rather than a bivalent conception. Okay, well let's go on briefly to the contrast with other types of liberty. The first, e <coughs> the first is negative liberty versus positive liberty. Now, at least since the days of Isaiah Berlin in the 1950s and 1960s, when Berlin was at, at the height of his influence, um, his famous essay, Two Concepts of Liberty, contrasts negative liberty with positive liberty. But that contrast had been drawn before Berlin. It had been drawn to some, to some extent by Benjamin Constant and others um, and the, uh, the contrast as I'm drawing it, um, I'm largely following the terminology here of Charles Taylor in the famous essay of his on Berlin, a 1979 essay of his, um, in which he distinguishes between what he calls opportunity concepts and, and um, outcome concepts or, or uh, achievement concepts. And that's, that, I think, pretty accurately captures the main distinction. Berlin draws a number of distinctions, not all of which I think are apposite. But this distinction, I think, captures the essence of the split between negative liberty and positive liberty. So negative liberty, as is suggested by the F postulate, would be pri c consist primarily in opportunities or combinations of opportunities. That is, things that are open to people to do or to become or to be. Whereas positive liberty consists in certain types of achievements or accomplishments. So for a positive liberty theorist, it's not enough to have the opportunity to do certain things. One must actually have done them. One must have availed oneself of those opportunities and actually achieved certain things. And there are many different versions of positive liberty uh, thinking, um, which I won't have any time to expound here, but I'll simply mention a few of them. Um, one of the most common would be that unless a person has attained autonomy by subjecting his inclinations and preferences to rational scrutiny and refinement, then the person is not truly free. The person is still enslaved to sub-rational uh, drives and, and concerns. And so one positive liberty document would be uh, the, the ideal of positive liberty is rational autonomy. Another common one, the, the only other one I'll mention here is um, to understand positive liberty as uh, can, being realized through democratic institutions of public decision making. And so when citizens interact with one another through democratic institutions and through public deliberation, public practical reasoning, um, they thereby attain true freedom. It's only through these processes that people become truly free. This, of course, is a notion associated with Rousseau and, and more recently with the uh, deliberative democratic theorists. Um, I won't mention any other, but there are numerous other um, variations of this ideal of positive liberty. And in each case, the notion is 
that opportunities aren't sufficient for true freedom, that the opportunities must have been seized, the opportunities must have been taken or exercised. Okay. A second contrast here is between negative liberty and republican liberty. And in recent years, this contrast has, I think, somewhat overshadowed the traditional contrast between negative liberty and positive liberty. Um, the two most prominent theorists uh, in the present day as uh, civic republicans are Philip Pettit and Quentin Skinner, um, but there are numerous others as well, Richard Bellamy, Richard Dagger, any number of others. Um, and they, although they agree with negative liberty theorists against positive liberty theorists, that is, civic republican theorists are not proponents of positive liberty. Nonetheless, they believe that the way in which the ideal of negative liberty has been understood by most of its ex exponents from Berlin onward is too narrow. And so they want to insist that there's a distinctive republican ideal of freedom, which they characterize as the absence of domination rather than the absence of interference. Now, I have to say that I think in all respects that are relevant to our present purposes, this contrast is unsustainable. I have argued this point at length in my book, The Quality of Freedom, indeed at great length for more than 100 pages, I argue against civic republicans. Um, and I think that all the virtues of their theory can be, can be and are accommodated within the neg contemporary negative liberty theories. I think that some weaknesses of their theory, by contrast, are not similarly weaknesses of the negative liberty theories. So I don't regard civic republicanism as genuinely a worthwhile and distinctive mode of thought, but I'll briefly state the idea behind it. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Civic Republicans maintain that negative liberty theorists like Ian Carter and me believe that the only constraints on people's freedom are the actual application of force or coercion. Um, and they contrast that with what they take to be, they, they of course, uh, Pettit and Skinner and others agree that the actual application of force or coercion is a freedom constraining factor. But they would insist that also constra um, constraining freedom are background conditions of domination whereby one party is subordinated to another party. And so there may be no need for the actual application of force because the subordinated party is too diffident, too timid to resist the dominant party's superiority. And as should be evident, from, and I hope this is evident, from the U postulate where I say that dispositions are freedom, con uh, freedom constraining factors or unfreedom producing factors. Um, as is evident, I fully agree that these background conditions of domination identified by civic republican theorists are constraining of freedom. I, indeed, I would insist that they constrain freedom. And therefore, there's no difference between the civic republicans and me on that. There's no difference between the civic republicans and Ian Carter on that. Um, indeed, I would venture to say that there's no difference between the civic republicans and any contemporary negative liberty theorist um, on that point. And therefore, I don't think this contrast is genuinely sustainable. I should, I should acknowledge, incidentally, that I think some negative liberty theorists in the past including in one or two passages, though very seldom Isaiah Berlin himself did suggest that um, the only sort of constraint on freedom is uh, the actual application of force or coercion. Friedrich Hayek also suggests that. But no contemporary negative liberty theorist of whom I'm aware takes that view. And therefore, I think whatever the historical validity of the civic republican theory may be, I don't think that as a contribution to contemporary debates over freedom, it really has a valuable role to play. I, again, I'm being rather harsh here, but I've, made, I've 
made these points at much greater length in my book, The Quality of Freedom. Okay, and finally, the final contrast, the final point that I will talk through here is the distinction between physical freedom and deontic freedom. Deontic here you can understand is synonymous with normative. Um, and if one looks at the F postulate and the U postulate, one will notice straight away that the chief concepts there are modal concepts rather than deontic concepts. That is, they pertain to what can or cannot happen, to what can or cannot be done, rather than to what may or may not be done. That is, rather than to what it is permissible for someone to do or, or not to do. Um, and so the distinction here is between abilities or inabilities, which are modal in character, that is, they pertain to what is possible or impossible, and permissibility, that is, to what is permissible or forbidden. And the abilities and inabilities, as I say, are modal, that is, they pertain to what it's physically possible or impossible for somebody to do. Incidentally, physically here is not to be contrasted with mentally or psychologically. I'm including mental and psychological abilities and inabilities in the physical abilities and inabilities. Instead, the contrast here is between physical and normative, physical and deontic. And deontic freedoms and unfreedoms would be um, would concern what it is permissible for someone to do, what someone can legitimately do, what someone is entitled to do, versus what someone is forbidden to do, what someone may not legitimately do. Okay. And that's the relevant distinction here between abilities and permissions. And this is a standard distinction, um, but it's of some importance for understanding the rest of my remarks. So I draw it here along with the other two contrasts. Okay, now the rest of the paper I'm going to read, this should take about 20 minutes, so I won't really overrun my time here. Um, and this is the portion of the paper focused on freedom and the rule of law. So far, all I've talked about is freedom. I'm now going to discuss the relationship between freedom and the rule of law. And I'm arguing against here a line of reasoning propounded recently by Nigel Simmons, N.E. Simmons, who is my principal jurisprudential colleague at Cambridge. And this line of reasoning is put forward in a book of his published in 2007 called Law as a Moral Idea. So Nigel is a natural law theorist, I'm a legal positivist, so though we're colleagues, we're, not, we're in firm disagreement here. Okay, so I'll, I'll read the rest of the paper, but I, I think you'll be able to follow it reasonably easily, even though I'm reading. With the negative positive and negative republican and physical deontic distinctions in hand, we are now in a position to assess a recent effort by Nigel Simmons to establish that a certain moral desideratum, the desideratum of liberty, is intrinsically and distinctively served by the rule of law. Simmons has sought in some of his earlier work to trace inherent connections between the rule of law and freedom, and I have elsewhere rebutted his assertions along these lines. So this isn't the first round in the fighting here, but Nigel has recently come up with this new line of reasoning with, to which I'll be responding here. Incidentally, we've also clashed on various other issues concerning legal positivism and natural law theory, but the, issue, the issues on which I'm concentrating here concern the role of freedom. So we shall here investigate whether his recent attempt to trace inherent connections between the rule of law and freedom is any more successful than his earlier attempts. <clears throat> Given that the purported demonstration of an intrinsic link between the rule of law and liberty is a central element of Simmons's endeavor to displace legal positivism with his own natural law theory, my inquiry into his account of freedom is of major jurisprudential significance. So I now want to go through some preliminary exposition of his argument. 
In the following passage, this is passage A on your handout. In the following passage, Simmons begins to expound his conception of liberty. So passage A. Regimes may observe the rule of law and yet narrowly restrict the repertoire of actions lawfully available to the citizen. However, the concept of liberty is not a simple idea that can helpfully be equated with the availability of a range of choices. It is conceivable that a free man might have fewer options available to him than a slave. And this is so whether we judge the availability of options by reference to the number of normative prohibitions bearing upon the agent or the number of factual restrictions. The connection between slavery and a restricted set of options is therefore purely contingent. Yet we do not think that slavery is only contingently connected with freedom. We think of slavery as the very embodiment of unfreedom. Even when the slave has an extensive range of options available to him, we think of him as unfree. This is presumably because of the conditions under which he enjoys that extensive range of options, for they, for they are fully dependent upon the will of the master. Okay, so that's the first main passage I'm going to read from Simmons. Now I return to my own prose. Simmons does not cite any writings from the huge philosophical literature on freedom, and he does nothing to elucidate the notion of slavery that plays such a salient role in his remarks. He relies quite heavily on an unexplicated intuitions. Hence, the reconstruction of his conception of liberty has to be slightly conjectural. Nonetheless, the gist of his account can be worked out with reference to the distinctions drawn in the preceding portions of this essay. So the three contrasts that I drew a few minutes ago, I'm going to use in order to flesh out Simmons' conception of liberty. So first, let us take the negative-positive contrast. Although Simmons invokes the concept of a free man, and although that concept is often associated with theories of positive liberty, his conception of freedom appears to be predominantly negative. He believes that an account of freedom as opportunities or as combinations of opportunities is inadequate. But he does not suggest that such an account should be replaced by a positive liberty focus on achievements. Instead, as becomes even clearer in the following passage, passage B on your handout, which appears immediately after the passage quoted above, passage A, he is contending that questions about the sheer range of the opportunities open to this or that person should be conjoined with questions about the dependence of those opportunities on the wills of other people. So now passage B. There are, as it were, two different dimensions to freedom. One concerning the range of options available to us without interference, and the other concerning the degree to which that range of options is itself dependent upon the will of another. In claiming that the rule of law is intrinsically linked to liberty, we rely upon the same concept of liberty that is invoked in treating slavery as intrinsically violative of liberty. Simmons nowhere explains the relationship between his two dimensions of liberty, and he therefore omits to reveal how those dimensions are to be combined in a philosophical analysis. However, he appears to presume that they amount to individually necessary and jointly sufficient conditions for the existence of various freedoms. In other words, someone is free to fi if and only if, one, she has an opportunity to fi, and two, the continued existence of that opportunity is not dependent on the will of anyone else. This understanding of freedom is a variant, a highly problematic variant, as we shall see, of the negative liberty theorist's understanding. It is not a doctrine of positive liberty. So I take Simmons to be a negative liberty theorist. Indeed, his conception of liberty, as I'll say in a moment, is very close to that of the civic republicans and also very close to that of Friedrich Hayek. Um, but he's not a positive liberty theorist, as far as I can tell. OK, so let's now go on to the negative republican distinction. As has been remarked, Simmons does not cite anything in the philosophical literature on freedom. I, I tend to highlight this point because I find it breathtaking that someone who is making his whole theory hinge on 
a putatively inherent connection between the rule of law and freedom, displays no knowledge whatsoever of the contemporary literature on freedom. Anyway, so, uh, I mentioned that. Um, there, in order to bring about true acrimony, one has to be the colleague of one's opponent. Okay, as has been remarked, Simmons does not cite anything in the philosophical literature on freedom. Hence, we have to speculate about the inspiration for his ascription of central importance to the property of dependence on the wills of others. Perhaps he has been most heavily influenced by the works of Friedrich Hayek, though his sole reference to Hayek is in a different context on a different point. But his views may also have been shaped by the civic republican tradition. Theorists such as Pettit and Skinner repeatedly declare that the correlate of domination is dependence. Skinner, for example, writes as follows when recounting the attitudes of civic republicans toward the discretionary dominance of tyrants. And this is passage C on your handout. This is from Quentin Skinner's 1998 book, Liberty Before Liberalism. If you live under any form of government that allows for the exercise of prerogative or discretionary powers outside the law, you will already be living as a slave. The very fact that your rulers possess such arbitrary powers means that the continued enjoyment of your civil liberty remains at all times dependent on their good will. But this is to say that you remain subject or liable to having your rights of action curtailed or withdrawn at any time. And this is just one of many passages that I could have drawn from Skinner's work and from Pettit's work. That is, this notion of unfreedom as dependence is a central theme in their work. <coughs> a host of other statements along the same lines bestrew the books and essays in which Skinner and Pettit have characterized civic republican freedom as the antithesis of domination. Thus, although Simmons makes no mention of any of their works, his conception of liberty can fairly be classified as republican. Consequently, he is vulnerable to the criticisms, criticisms of civic republicanism that have been synopsized in an earlier section of the essay. The criticisms are fully presented in my book, The Quality of Freedom, but I've summarized them earlier in the essay. I haven't gone into them here because we don't have time. <coughs> Indeed, as will be argued shortly, Simmons takes a fatally problematic position when he insists that a person's independence of the wills of others is a necessary condition for the existence of that person's freedoms. Okay, so finally now let us consider the contrast between physical and deontic freedom, just as the preliminary exposition of Simmons's theory of freedom, and then I'll go on to offer my critique. In the first and longer of my two quotations from Simmons above, that is passage A on your handout, he indicates that his conception of freedom can construe the availability of options either as the absence of physical restrictions or as the absence of deontic restrictions. He allows that someone who is classifiable as a slave might face fewer physical constraints and normative constraints on her activities than might someone who is classifiable as a free person. Given as much, his conception of slavery is badly in need of elaboration, which it nowhere receives. Does Simmons think, for example, that a person is classifiable as a slave whenever she can be exchanged to someone by somebody else for a payment? Does he consequently believe that professional baseball players and basketball players are slaves? Does he think that such athletes are unfree to play their sports for their teams because the continuation of their opportunities to play for those teams is dependent on the wills of the team's owners and administrators? Though Simmons sheds no light on these questions, the final one of them prefigures a broader objection to his analysis that I will raise imminently. For the moment, we can simply note that his conception of freedom encompasses both physical liberty and deontic liberty. My critique of his conception will concentrate chiefly on physical freedom, for his subsequent remarks, which I will examine below, are applicable mainly to physical freedom. <clears throat> okay, I'm now going on to my critique of Simmons, and this will be ab uh, probably about 10 minutes.
As will now be contended, Simmons' account of freedom is unsustainable. Accordingly, his endeavor to demonstrate the inherently moral character of law by positing an, in, an intrinsic connection between law and the ideal of liberty is a non-starter. Moreover, that endeavor itself, quite apart from the irreparably problematic conception of liberty on which it rests, is vitiated further by the, by the way in which it deals with slavery. So let's take the first problem, the problem that I call unfreedom everywhere. Immediately after the two passages from Simmons that have already been quoted, we encounter the key paragraph in which he seeks to show the indissoluble connection between law and freedom. This is passage D on your handout. When a citizen lives under the rule of law, it is conceivable that the duties imposed upon him or her will be very extensive and onerous, and the interstices between these duties might leave very few options available. Yet if the rule of law is a reality, the duties will have limits, and the limits will not be dependent upon the will of any other person. Might they be dependent upon the will of a sovereign lawmaker? One needs to remember here that laws must be prospective and must not be subject to constant change. At any one time, therefore, the law may conflict with the present will of the sovereign lawmaker. If we take seriously the conception of freedom to which Simmons adheres, we shall be led to a conclusion starkly at odds with the conclusion that he hopes to draw. That is, we shall be led to conclude that nobody living under a system of legal governance is ever free in any respect. According to Simmons's conception of liberty, a person is not free to fly unless the continuation of her opportunities to fly is independent of the wills of other people. Yet under the rule of law or under any other mode of governance, the continuation of anyone's opportunities is always dependent on the wills of other people. Most notably, the continued existence of the opportunities open to any person is dependent on the wills of legal governmental officials, who if they are so inclined can act concertedly to remove any of those opportunities, if necessary by slaying the person. In any particular context, of course, the officials may be utterly undisposed to act in such a fashion towards some particular individual. But their disinclination to act in that fashion is a product of their wills. At any given time, the fact that some person enjoys any opportunities to fly is due partly to the fact that the officials have not theretofore taken <coughs> excuse me, have not theretofore taken steps to remove or avert the existence of those opportunities. Their not having theretofore taken such steps is due to their not having willed to act thus. Similarly, at any given time, the fact that some person will continue to enjoy opportunities to fly is due partly to the, the fact that the officials are not currently taking steps to remove those opportunities. Their not currently taking such steps is due to their not having willed to act thus. Hence, if Simmons's conception of liberty were correct, we would have to conclude that everyone living within a society governed in conformity to the rule of law is unfree in all or virtually all respects. Precisely because Simmons's conception generates such a conclusion, his conception is fallacious. In the passage just quoted, that is passage D, Simmons obscures the role of the wills of legal governmental officials in the operations of legal systems because his reference to that role is tucked into the laconic antecedent of a conditional. I assume probably most of you are aware that a conditional statement or a, a conditional proposition is in the form of if x then y. And the, uh, the clause, the if x clause, is known as the antecedent of the conditional. And so we divide the conditional into an antecedent and a consequent. And I'm talking here about the first part of the conditional statement, the if excellent. Okay, so let me read that sentence again. In the passage just quoted, 
Simmons obscures the role of the wills of legal governmental officials in the operations of legal systems because his reference to that role is tucked into the laconic antecedent of the conditional. The second sentence of that passage, the second sentence of passage D, begins with the words, yet if the rule of law is a reality, those seemingly innocuous words encapsulate the decisive role of the wills of legal governmental officials in upholding the limits on legal duties that Simmons mentions. At any given time, the continuation of the rule of law as such throughout a legal system as a whole or in any particular context within a system is dependent on the inclinations of legal governmental officials. Ergo, to say that the limits on people's legal duties are dependent on the reality of the rule of law is in effect to say that those limits are dependent on the wills of legal governmental officials. According to Simmons's conception of freedom then, the interstices carved out by those limits on legal duties are not domains of freedom. All the opportunities within those interstices are not genuine freedoms, according to his conception, for the continuation of those opportunities is dependent on the continuation of legal governmental officials' inclinations to abide by the rule of law. Of course, it may be extremely unlikely that the legal governmental officials in some particular regime will depart from their current inclinations to abide by the rule of law. In that event, the regime's officials are resolutely undisposed to extinguish the opportunities that are available to people within the interstices carved out by the limits on legal duties. If there are no other factors that are likely to terminate or impair those opportunities, then the opportunities are securely available. For Simmons, however, the secure availability of the opportunities is not sufficient to warrant their being classified as freedoms. On the contrary, they are clearly not freedoms according to his conception of liberty because their secure availability is dependent on the wills of legal governmental officials. It is dependent on the officials remaining disinclined to deviate from the rule of law. In short, far from being able to conclude validly that the rule of law is inherently connected to freedom, Simmons is committed to the conclusion that everyone living under the rule of law is comprehensively unfree. The difficulties that he faces are akin to those faced by civic republicans when they declare that freedoms exist only if the occurrence of dominating interference by other people is not merely unlikely but impossible. Pettit writes, for example, that the point of establishing a Republican government with, <coughs> under the rule of law is not just to make arbitrary interference improbable, the point is to make it inaccessible. That's the quotation from Pettit. As I have maintained elsewhere in my book, The Quality of Freedom, this Republican objective is a sheer fantasy that can never be realized in any society. To insist on its realization as a condition for the existence of any freedoms is to commit oneself to the thesis that everyone in every society is comprehensively unfree. Simmons has saddled himself with a similarly unpalatable conclusion. Okay, I now come to the final main section of the paper, which is short. Um, and this deals with the way, Simmons deal, uh, the way Simmons specifically addresses the issue of slavery. Let us probe one further passage from Simmons, which immediately follows those that have already been quoted. This is the final passage on your handout, passage E. The law might, of course, serve to establish slavery, but slaves are objects of proprietary right, not the bearers of legal rights and duties. To that extent, they stand outside the system of dual relationships. If, however, the slaves enjoy certain legal protections against the violence of their masters, for example, those protections are independent of the will of others and dependent upon the law. To be governed by law is to enjoy a degree of independence from the will of others. This passage suffers from the same major problem that afflicts the immediately preceding passage. That is, it errs in suggesting that dependence upon the law entails independence of the wills of other people, 
and it consequently errs in suggesting that opportunities whose continued existence depends partly upon the law are classifiable by Simmons's freedoms. Instead of considering that problem afresh, however, we should glance here at one further point. Simmons acknowledges that the rule of law can serve to establish the institution of chattel slavery. In a discussion aimed at drawing an inherent connection between law and liberty, where liberty is understood as the antithesis of slavery, such an acknowledgement is hardly inconsequential. However, Simmons seeks to defuse it by observing that slaves devoid of any legal protections are only the objects of jural relations and are not themselves jural subjects. Though such an observation is unexceptionable in itself, it does not counteract the damagingness of the fact that the rule of law can serve to establish the institution of chattel slavery. After all, the slaves remain human beings when they are excluded from the status of jural subjects. Their very exclusion from that status within a particular legal system is inimical to the notion that every such system serves the value of liberty. Simmons cannot vindicate that mistaken notion by pointing out that the unprotected slaves are not jural subjects. The very fact that they are not jural subjects within the legal governmental system that presides over them and defines the nature of their slavery is precisely what renders so ludicrous the idea that that system serves the value of liberty. Of course, given Simmons's conception of liberty, even the jural subjects within any legal system are comprehensively unfree because the continued existence of each subject's opportunities is dependent partly on the continued disinclination of legal governmental officials to squelch those opportunities by departing from the rule of law, no subject's opportunities qualify as freedoms under Simmons's conception. Even under a more sensible conception of freedom that does not generate such a conclusion about the jural subjects, moreover, the fact that a legal governmental system might reduce many human beings to chattel slavery with no protections against arbitrary onslaughts is a ground for rejecting the thesis that the rule of law is intrinsically linked to liberty. That's a quotation from Simmons. No sizable society can secure ample degrees of freedom for individuals without the rule of law. But likewise, no sizable society can sustain the institution of chattel slavery over a long period without the rule of law. Hence, we should neither infer that the rule of law is inherently connected to liberty, nor infer that it is inherently connected to slavery. Instead, we should recognize that its moral bearings are protean. And finally, I come to a one-paragraph conclusion. This essay has brought together some of the ideas about freedom that I have developed in my work on political philosophy and some of the ideas about the rule of law that I have developed in my work on legal philosophy. Though a negative liberty position in the former domain neither entails nor is entailed by a legal positivist position in the latter domain, the two positions can combine fruitfully. In particular, this essay has endeavored to expose both the inadequacy of Simmons's conception of freedom and the untenability of his natural law insistence on an intrinsic connection between law and the ideal of liberty. In this context, and undoubtedly in a number of other contexts as well, a solid grasp of matters in political philosophy contributes to a solid grasp of jurisprudential matters. Okay, that's the end. We'll now throw it open to discussion. Okay, thank you very much.